Okay, so now let's move on a little bit. We're gonna start getting into a little bit of anatomy. Uh, I'm, gonna move, I'm gonna move through anatomy really quickly. Um, I think anatomy, you can really kind of do, you really should just look at these slides and study, study the slides, um, look at these photos. Like I, think, I don't think I really have to spend a ton of time on it. Um, I'll spend a little more time on, on phonology than that. So, but just to clear up again, some terms, we've already talked about this um, before, but remember variety is the member of the wild population that can't interbreed uh, freely. It's just, it's true to type when you plant it from seed. Uh, this is the technical, the technical terms, okay? And a cultivar is a cultivated variety. It's not true to type when you plant it from seed. So when you go out and you get a Pinot Noir seed and you put it in the ground, you will not get a Pinot Noir grape Chances are you won't actually get a plant that produces any fruit at all, um, but it definitely will not be Pinot Noir. Okay, so but if you wanted to, you could go out and plant a thousand seeds and create your own grape, uh, which a fella has done uh, this project. I don't really know where they are in this process or if they've really kind of followed through. It's a it's a massive undertaking, but they planted thousands of seeds and they were just trying to make these selections and, and get a unique variety in that way, uh, rather than through, you know, classical breeding. Um, but like I said, generally we just, we use variety and cultivar interchangeably as an industry. Again, this is how you, you've seen this in 1104, this is how you see it written. Uh, so it'd be Vitis vinifera, L stands for the first fella who really kind of wrote this down and described the uh, species. That's Carl, Lin Carl Linnaeus. Uh, and then CV is cultivar. So it's Vitis vinifera, Carl Linnaeus, cultivar, Pinot Noir, okay? And then VAR is variety. So these are uh, native uh, Japanese uh, species and varieties from those species, okay? Cool. Now, recall again from 1104, you're gonna hear me talk about clones in this course. So clones are just vegetative reproductions of a cultivar. So a cultivar will slightly change its genetics in the field, right, over time. As that cultivar ages, um, just the kind of the way genetics works, it just sort of starts to mutate a little bit, right? You're not you're not getting a completely different cultivar, but you're getting uh, just different characteristics of that cultivar. So Pinot Noir, for instance, has some of the most uh, clones of any grape variety out there, and that's because Pinot Noir is one of the oldest cultivars that we're growing. Um, so Pinot Noir is probably one of the closest, like so many things are derived from Pinot, right? Chardonnay, I believe, is a cousin or might be a sibling of, or not sibling, it, uh, uh, offspring of Pinot Noir. It's a cousin. Um, but so many, so many things come from Pinot. Um, so it's very old. It's probably one step away from its wild parent. Um, and because of that, there's a lot of genetic diversity. And so you get things like clone 23, what we call Maria Feld, which is giant. Look at that cluster. It's huge. It's huge, right? The average Pinot Noir cluster is like, it's kind of like this. It's like 100 berries, All right? That's about 100 berries. This thing is like 200, 300 berries. That's gigantic. It's like a baby's arm. It's huge. Um, so... And oftentimes, too, when this is growing in kind of cooler cooler regions, uh, 23 will look really kind of scraggly looking. If you come out and look at Clone 23 in the Lansing Vineyard here, it looks like a way more open cluster than the other varieties uh, or other clones. Um, so it almost looks like a completely different, almost looks like a completely different variety, but it's not. It's still Pinot. Um, and yeah, so that's that's what that's what clones are. And you can have clones that have different flavors as well. So this this is kind of mainly just a different size. So you can you, clone twenty three crops a little bit higher, uh, ripens a little bit slower because the crop loads a little bit higher. Um, so typically we see clone twenty three being used in uh, like the central coast of California where it's a bit hotter and they need to slow ripening down a bit. Okay. Uh, but then there are clones of Pinot like Pinot Percoche, which some people would say is a different cultivar, but it's probably really more of a different clone than a different cultivar. It, and it's a really fast ripening clone. Um, but then, yeah, you can get different flavors from things. So there are 
clones of Chardonnay, for instance, called the Musquet clones. Uh, one of them is, it's, uh, I believe it's Chardonnay. Oh, the numbers escape me now. It's like 848 or something. Uh, but the Musquet clones, there's like three of them. Uh, and they have terpenes inside them. So they like in their, within their mesocarp, within the flesh of the grape. And the terpenes give you like kind of floral, kind of Turkish delight type. Think about like Gewürztraminer, right? Um, those kinds of flavors and aromas. Uh, and Chardonnay, when you think of Chardonnay, it's just kind of a neutral white wine, right? Um, so these Musquet clones will give you more aromatic impact, okay? And it's still Chardonnay. All right, so we're going to talk about anatomy. We're gonna, I'm going to go pretty quick through this uh, because, like I said, I think you can just kind of look at these slides. Uh, and that's what you should do is just look at them, understand all the parts of the vine, maybe make some little flashcards with, with vine diagrams, like maybe take this diagram and take off the names of stuff and, you know, whatever. Um, so remember, most plants, most Vitis vinifera that we have around the world is a grafted grapevine, where we have a rootstock, which the rootstock is generally uh, some sort of derivative that like that's a, a cross between native North American species. Um, and then it's we graft on the scion. And the scion is usually Vitis vinifera, right? And remember, the main reason that we are grafting a rootstock on is to deal with phylloxera, which can cause the vine to die. Okay? Simple, right? There's, of course, other things that we use for rootstocks for, like, like I showed you, Zephinium index, um, you know, managing vigor to some extent. We'll choose a rootstock based on that. Uh, um, you know, all kinds of different, like, if you have salt in your soils, you have salty soils because of drought. Um, you know, drought tolerance is a big issue. Oftentimes, rootstocks that are can deal with salty soils can also deal with droughts. Of course, that makes sense. Um, so, so there's a lot of different reasons you might choose a uh, rootstock, right? And you all are going to do that in your project for us when you choose rootstocks for your given uh, variety and given region. If you have a region that is drought prone, then you're probably going to want to use a rootstock that has a vertical rooting angle and is uh, drought tolerant, right? Okay. So you have the top part, the scion, which is usually Vitis vinifera, and then it's grafted onto the rootstock, okay? Simple enough. Then you have this thing here, that that's the graft union, right there, that little bulbous bit. Uh, so you have the rootstocks down here, and then that's the scion. And then you see this stuff coming up, those are called suckers. And suckers are just these like, I call them adventitious shoots. Uh, apparently they are not, that's not what they are. They're really just like latent buds. Uh, and they push, they push these up. Um, and suckers are just these little shoots that come up from the rootstock. Uh, yeah. And then we sometimes have water sprouts, which are just little shoots, little latent buds that come off the trunk. Okay. Cool. This graft union is a point of weakness physically. Uh, it's and in the winters and hard winters, like we have here in the Northeast, uh, the graft union can split, and then a bacteria called Agrobacterium can get in via the soil. The Agrobacterium lives in the soil, and then it gets into those those cracks, and then it forms a disease called crown gall, which is what I told you about earlier on in this uh, this lecture. The head of the vine is where things like spurs, cordons, and canes will emanate from. So you'll have a trunk, and then up here is the head. Okay, that's the, just the top of the vine, and then stuff starts sprawling out or whatever from there. Um, simple. Canes and cordons, again, you should remember this from 1104. I spent a bit of time talking about this in there. Um, Typically, this is how you'll see vines pruned, is either in these two fashions, uh, with canes or with cordons. Uh, so canes are where we just take, there's a shoot that grew out this year. Um, so this shoot sort of growing in, so say this shoot is going vertically. That shoot was growing vertically in, uh, you know, starting in April of 2020. And then come the winter, we take that little shoot and we roll it down on the wire, uh, and it now becomes a cane on our wire, and then shoots are gonna emerge from these buds, okay? 
And we just do that every year. And we cut it back and then we lay a new shoot down. Okay, simple. Cordons are basically just trunk extensions, right? You take a cane, you just leave it there, and then shoots emerge from each of these little buds. And then you cut those shoots down to little two bud spurs. Sometimes, sometimes two bud spurs. Sometimes it's more than two buds, it just depends. You cut them down to these little spurs and you just keep doing that. And over time they build up, 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 and then you renew the cordon, okay? So a cane is a vine shoot uh, from the period that it matures. And once it turns brown or woody, that's when it becomes a cane, okay? Uh, and then we'll, we, we might lay it down if we're doing cane pruding. And a cordon is just kind of a trunk extension uh, present, positioned horizontally or at an angle, right? Um, and then spurs are just canes that we cut down to something between like a two to like a four bud, uh, to four buds per spur. And then shoots are going to arise from that spur, okay? So... What I'm pointing at in this photo is a cane here. Uh, so that, the, the, the year before this, that was a shoot. It was green. It went brown like this did. This is what's called periderm that it forms. Uh, it went brown and then we pruned the grapevine and then we laid the cane down on the wire. And that cane has these little buds on it. Right, and then from each bud, new shoots emerged. Right, so that's what you're seeing there. Over here, um, the this is a cordon right here. Just so, so imagine just taking that cane and then just we just left it there. So now we're going to come back in the winter, and instead of laying down one of these canes, we're going to cut two bud spurs here. And then two shoots are going to emerge out of each spur. And you can see that there. So that's what that is there. That's a spur position. And it's kind of built up a little bit. Okay? Cool. I believe this is uh, Tempranillo, by the way. It looks very distinct and strange. Very, very uh, um, spherical berries. Okay? All right. Other, this is other uh, things you should you should know in terms of anatomy. Go ahead and look at this. Um, you know, maybe pause this video here and just really look at it. Um, you don't need to know the the leaf stuff. This is more used for ampelography, which is the uh, kind of study of like how you identify grape varieties by just looking at it, looking at the plant. Um, but what the things you should kind of know are nodes. So nodal positions are just where the buds are on the canes, so the little nodule bits, right? And then internode spaces are just the, the distance between the nodes. So oftentimes you'll hear me talk about things like large internode spaces um, and short internodes. That's, that's what I'll be talking about. Um, so, yeah. And then what else? Then clusters, of course. The petiole is the leaf stem, right? It's the little stem that attaches the leaf to the main stem. Uh, the leaf blade, of course, is, the, is exactly as it sounds. It's the leaf blade. Um, that's important because we often will take one organ over another for uh, nutrient analysis. A lateral shoot is a shoot that arises from, like, there's like a little bud in here. It's its own little thing. And then little shoots can arise out of here, okay? So you have the main shoot, then you have a leaf, and then in the leaf axle, you can have a lateral bud, and then it'll start pushing out like its own shoot. And that's problematic when a grapevine does that because it increases canopy density, okay? Tendrils are the climbing organelles, uh, or, yeah, like um, organs, rather not organelles, organs. Uh, and, uh, yeah, and then up top you have the, the, the growth stip the growth uh, tip. And within the growth tip, you have a meristem, which is um, like a undifferentiated tissue. And it's then it starts differentiating and starts creating leaves and tendrils and that sort of thing. Okay. Uh, and then over on the grape cluster itself, you have the peduncle, which is the stem that attaches the grape uh, cluster to the, to the shoot. Uh, and then this is what's called the rachis, which is that collection of all that stem 
material, right? And then the pedicel is the little stem that attaches the berry to the rachis. Okay? I know that's a lot, uh, but, you know, pause it. Really just kind of absorb this because this kind of stuff, I'm going to use these words pretty quickly uh, just at will in the future courses. All right. And again, I'll just flip through this. Uh, I'll provide you with uh, this slide deck. Um, but I, I just kind of went through all this. I talked about suckers and water sprouts earlier. Um, suckers are just little shoots coming out of the below ground. And then water sprouts are the shoots that are up on the trunk that are scion material. Okay. Again, I just went over blades, tendrils, all that stuff. So I'm going to move through this. Jack, uh, again, sorry for the, the, the slide here, but a, a, a jack, this is an, an industry term. It's just like several pedestals together. It's only useful to know this because winemakers will often talk about uh, destemmers, and you put the fruit through the destemmer, and it might just like shred rachises. It might not be super um, gentle, and they'll get a lot of what are called jacks in the in the bins that when they when they come out um, or in the tanks, right? And they they often don't like that because they think the little jacks will impart some sort of green flavor onto the wine. I personally doubt that jacks have really much of an influence on wine quality, uh, but I do think having a bunch of jacks come through your distemmer is is kind of indicative of how rough that distemmer is. Uh, but also maybe possibly just the architecture of the cluster itself. Some some varieties are going to have more jacks than others. Um, just kind of depends on the rake is, but yeah. Okay. The fruit zone is just generally fruit in a grapevine is in this kind of conserved area. Uh, so when you hear me talk about fruit zone, it's that kind of like lower third of the canopy. Okay. I'm going to uh, stop this one here, and then we're going to move into uh, discussing roots.